Look, it is it is great to be here. Lovely to see your faces, and uh, it it's also absolutely um, uh, with a lot of joy that I come and uh, able to bring you a uh, a summary of what's uh, what's happening in uh, in Africa, particularly. And uh, this trip has been uh, very interesting because of um, other contacts that we've made and people that wanted to make contact with us, and and I had meetings with them, and it's been really um, uh, fun to be able to uh, sit down and talk with them and uh, tell them about what we see and what we understand. Um, just maybe before we, before I go into the little summary of, of the Africa uh, situation that we have, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, false accusers, and, and so forth, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. And in verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the heading of what I want to talk about with you this afternoon is the truth, the main game. Truth is the main game. The world and humanity is in the position it is at the moment with all the turmoil that's gone through over the ages because of one thing, because of a lie. That's all it was. It was just believing a lie. And I'm here to encourage us to believe the truth. And I want to talk to you today about truth and what is truth. And I want to encourage us all to see it and to understand and hopefully to be able to bring it together to excite each and every one of us how wonderfully we've been exposed to truth. And it's up to us to believe the truth. And even in this times of great insecurity, you see, where I've just come from, I see a different thing than where we are here. I see, I see people keen, excited to hear about the gospel, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, people uh, given the opportunity to be baptized and to be wonderfully filled with God's Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, the power of God, the wonderful healing testimonies. And we see uh, many hundreds baptized regularly. We see our church, particularly in Malawi, growing to well over 14,000 spirit-filled people, and that ain't, uh, that ain't happening here. I'm not blind, I can see. And it's not because of our doctrine, it's not because of our gospel and our understanding, it's because of truth. People want to believe a lie. And we're here because we want to believe a truth. And I'm going to be talking about what truth really means. You are not going to find the meaning of truth in a dictionary. Not the real meaning of truth. And today, hopefully, I'll be able to show you what truth really means and how we've been exposed to it and how we are not to listen to a lie. And the reason why we live in perilous times today is because people are still listening to a lie. And even spirit-filled people, it is, it is understood scripturally that if they're not careful, they can go back and listen to a lie and be conned and duped from the truth that they have received and been exposed to. And I want to encourage us in the truth that we have been exposed to and what that means. And it's interesting because uh, in Nairobi, I had a meeting with uh, some people that were very keen, a pastor that was very keen for his uh, church in Rwanda to come and be part of us because of, um, because of what he's seen and read on the internet and so forth. And, uh, and, and also um, 
a, a, a fellow who received the Holy Spirit in the revival centers back in Mukamani back in 2005, but because of the politics that went on at that particular time, uh, moved to Mombasa, where he got a job, brought his wife down and family and started to work there. And now because the situation has been tidied up, he's contacted us and wants to come and, and be in fellowship with us. And we got together and had a meeting with our folk uh, from Katui and Mukamani, from this chap from uh, Mombasa, also from Benjamin from um, uh, uh, Rwanda, and we had a get together. And uh, the, um, the pastor from uh, Rwanda, Benjamin, uh, because his English wasn't that good, he brought with him an interpreter, and the interpreter, uh, his name was James. And uh, James is an interesting young man, he's 23 years old, and um, he can speak five languages, and uh, he uh, teaches piano and the guitar, and just a remarkable, bright um, young man. And of course, uh, I'm there with the pastor from Rwanda, uh, wanting to talk to him about uh, our vision and so forth. And this young man is interpreting, and of course, he's getting an earful. He can't help it, can he? So he's getting an earful. Anyway, as time goes on, we're talking about what we see and what we believe and understand. As time goes on, the young man says, whoa, um, uh, I speak in tongues. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And, um, and salvation is when you give your heart to the Lord. And... Uh, and which was really great that he sort of challenged me and uh, wanting a bit of a debate. And um, uh, because of time, we opened up the scriptures. I went through the scriptures and, uh, and, and he, said, he said to me, he said, I can't believe this. He said, I've gone to Bible college and university. He said, I've got a, I've got a degree in divinity. He said, I know my boy. I tell you what, he knew his scriptures. Trust me. He, he, he could, like this. He would, he, oh, you know, at the OK Corral, um, you know, six scriptures at 20 paces, he'd win. I'd be dead. He'd win. And he, and he said to me, but Pastor Vic, he said, all my learning. He said, I'm filled with the Spirit. I speak in tongues. I pray to God every day. All my learning and all my prayer, I never saw this. And he said, this is truth. What you are telling is correct. It's right. He said, wow, this is incredible. Look, and of course, we had a, we had a brilliant time. And, and I invited him because we had a, a combined meeting with Katui and Mukamani and the pastor from Mombasa. We had a combined meeting. I asked him to come with us in the car to Mukamani, which was about a five-hour drive. And we went there. So, nah, 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 nah. so all the way uh, there, and, it was, and, he, and, he, and he participated in the meeting. And we came back, and we're communicating. And he says to me, oh, God, I've got 16 people. I want to get baptized now. And, you know, so it's really quite exciting. And what I'm saying is, here, it seems like perilous times, but not over there. It's so cool. And this is our work. This is our gospel. Never forget this. Never forget that under understanding. And so we had a wonderful time with the pastors at, um, uh, in Malawi. We had uh, Pastor Frank from Mozambique and Moses from Congo. Uh, uh, we had um, um, uh, also Jonathan from Tanzania uh, who uh, flew down to, um, uh, to join our meetings and now we have an assembly uh, that is uh, starting and growing in, um, in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and also in Rwanda and, um, and uh, I think we're going to have a reasonably sized fellowship very soon in Nairobi, Kenya, because of James, he comes from Nairobi in Kenya. So the situation there is just excellent and wonderful. And one of the things that I spoke to the boys about and the pastors is, is, is a bigger picture of understanding and, and what it means and about God and his nature and his character. You know, I, I reminded them 
that, that when we start to see certain facts and foundations where things have got to fit and run true, we understand that the scripture tells us that it is impossible for God to lie. We understand that God puts no stumbling block in anybody's road. We understand that he tempts no man. We understand that he's no respecter of persons. He has no favorites. We understand that he's not the author of confusion. We understand that there is no variableness and shadow of turning in him. And when you start to put all this together, you think to yourself, well, where did the problem come from? It come from free will and rebellion. That's where it came from. And us believing a lie. God is pure. God is truth. There's no guile found in him. There's no variableness, shadows. To, he doesn't put a stumbling block. Well, I tell you what, there was a stumbling block in the Garden of Eden. And God never put it there. And we are, as we start to see and understand that God doesn't play games like that. This isn't, this isn't um, Warhammer 40,000 where you paint your little, uh, you know, um, soldiers and one goes there and then you sit down and you play war games. God doesn't play war games. He doesn't play garbage like that. God's, God is the most unbelievable creator and fairness and in every single way. And he is our God. And I want to talk about him and his truth. I want to talk about who he is and what he is and how exciting uh, we we are and we have to be in the position that we're in. In um, Let's have a look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I'd like us to go there just to start laying a little bit of a foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And Paul is writing here to the Corinthians and he, and he says here, from verse 23, and he's talking about, he's talking about uh, people that, um, that um, you know, are athletic, you know, in, uh, in athletics and, and run races, and we can equate to athleticism and to swimmers, and we can equate how they get up early in the morning, they train, and how they bring their body into subjection. We know in how they control their, their, their uh, diets and their regimes, and so forth, and, and Paul is giving us, giving us a, an example and an illustration, and he's saying to us here, know ye, know ye not that they which run a race run all, but there's one that receives the, a prize, but, but nevertheless uh, they all run to obtain, and every man strives for the mastery, and every man that, that wants to uh, be in this race, he's, he's tempered. He takes charge of himself. He's not like the others. He goes to training. He, he uh, brings himself under, uh, under authority and control. He takes his body uh, uh, and, and puts it under control. Now, they all do this to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible crown, he's, he's aligning it to a, come on, let's, let's pull ourselves up here. Let's take charge of this flesh and this body. And then he goes on and says something remarkable. He says here, But I keep my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means. And he's saying to us, after the explanation of the athletes, he's saying we're the same. There's something for us to do. We've got to take charge of this flesh. And the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit <clears throat> is to give us an opportunity to, wonderful, to, to, to wonderfully see the glory of God, but also to give us the power and the understanding to take control of this flesh that is poisoned. And it's so poisoned that God has declared this flesh cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It is beyond repair. And you're living in one right now, and so am I. We're living in a, in a body that's beyond repair, and I can't believe how old I'm getting. It's unbelievable. The teeth are falling out. I forgot to bring my denture thing in, so the teeth go flying out in a minute. But you understand. You, some of you can remember me when I was little. All right. 
and I keep myself under control. I want to, I'm, the theme is truth, the main game. And look, there's something here that is, that is just wonderful. Pastor Lloyd, many years ago, he embarked us on a journey of truth. We were filled with the Holy Ghost and power, which is the spirit of truth. And all the people said, and we're not going to get distracted by a lie. And I want to speak about truth, not because of your benefit particularly, but because I want to meet the Lord in the air. And Paul is writing here and he's saying, but I keep my body and bring it under subjection less because if I don't, even though I go and preach to others, I could be rejected. Now, there's something to grasp onto. Oh, Pastor Vic, you know, Africa and goes there and preaches there, and ministers here and does this and that. I tell you now, folks, it don't mean a brass razu to God. He loves what you do, but if you're doing it and you're not renewing and regenerating in your soul, you're cactus, Victor Samalenko. So I don't care how many meetings you come to, I don't care how many hallelujahs you do, you can sit there and say, oh yes, I come to every meeting and I know you oh, praise the Lord. I don't care. Neither does Paul, neither does God. What he cares about, if you see the truth and embrace it, which is the character of God, and embrace it and be an overcomer. What does that mean? Overcome your, your crummy character by putting on the character of God. That's what it means. Husbands, be a better husband. Wives, be a better wife. All these wonderful aspects that God has laid out before us in the character. And it just doesn't matter what you do. And I'm telling you now, I don't care if I've been going to Africa for nearly 28 years and I've been preaching this and I've been doing that and I've been doing that. It doesn't matter if, I am not, if I'm doing it for the wrong reason and I'm not embracing the character of the divine nature, which is God, in my life. And I'm not examining myself with fear and trembling. And I tell you what I do with fear and trembling. Because more than anything, my dear friends, I want to be saved. I don't care about anything else. I, I, I broke down this morning. I went to see my mother-in-law and she's got Alzheimer's really bad and she's in her chair and her teeth are out because she could swallow them and all that and she, she looks so ugly. She looks so bad in the physical. It just, I just broke down and wept. You know, seeing, and, and I tell you something, we think, human nature thinks this is normal. This is, this ain't normal to God. This is sick. God doesn't find any of this normal. We've been amongst it so long, we think it's all normal. Me looking like this ain't normal. I should, okay, I get that. I expected that from him, but it never came. We really have a problem. What is normal is for his creation to, si to shine brighter than the sun. What is normal is no death. God has no beginning. How on earth do you get your head around that? You know, you can look 20 zillion trillion years in the future and you can go, yep. But then if you look in the past and you say, but that's not even the beginning of when God was. He always was. I've got no doubt in my mind and heart there's wormholes, there's other universes, there's incredible things. God's been about this business forever. And he is fantastic. He puts up with no garbage. Something ugly developed in the Garden of Eden because they believed a lion had poisoned their humanity and it made them, it made them envious and jealous and, and, uh, and proud and all those wonderful characters of humanity and he took it and he threw it out of the Garden of Eden. 
And do you think for one minute that stuff is going to be allowed back in? Not on your life. That's why we're filled with the Holy Spirit for you to have a good look at yourself and change. You've got something to do. Do you think for one minute that, that, that because you, you, you speak in tongues you're saved? No. We know that just by elementary scripture. All it does, it, it shows us that we have opened up to God in a moment of humility and he filled us with his Holy Spirit so that gives us the opportunity now to move in, to see and to be, embrace the nature of God. You know, in the Old Testament it says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts, your thoughts are not his thoughts. Well, that's the Old Testament, buddy. It ain't the New Testament. Our ways have got to be his ways and our thoughts have got to be his thoughts. And all the people said, bring every thought under the captivity. Don't let your mind wander to garbage. Stop being garbage because you'll be thrown out as garbage. Even though you come to every meeting and speak in tongues. God has filled us with the Holy Spirit and he says, get your act together now. I filled you with my Holy Spirit so that you, you're given an opportunity to see me and get your act together. That's why Paul is saying here, he's saying, hey, I could go about and I can preach to people and, and, and see them saved and all that, and I myself could be a reject. Paul said that, not Vic. You can expect that from me. But Paul said that. And there's something in it as far as I'm concerned. I pay attention to that. And I think, whoa, let's have a look at myself, Victor. Let's have a look how I am and my behavior and my depth. Let's have a good look at myself. And this is why God has given me a new tongue. It's why he's given me access to pray in the Holy Ghost. Why do we pray in the Holy Ghost? To build ourselves up in the most holy faith. What is the holy faith? Oh, to know prophecy? Big deal, says God. To move a mountain? Big deal, says God. That ain't going to get you there. It ain't going to get you there. Have a look and be renewed and regenerated and move in to the metamorphosis that God has started within us. And Paul said here, and this is, this is something, I keep my body under subjection. I, you have to do something. Stop wandering. Stop, stop playing church. You have to do something. And Paul said, I keep, I keep my body under subjection because I know that if I don't, I'm going to be a reject. Friends, we've been, this is called the high calling. It ain't the low calling. This is, this has not happened before. God did not send his son to die before. This hasn't happened before. Of all the eons of time that have gone before us and all the eons of time to come, this has not happened before and you have an opportunity to be a son of God and do you think for one minute he's going to put up with the garbage you are happy to put up with? No. And this is exactly the way I preach in Africa. No. And you know what? They just, keep, they just keep coming. They love it. Friends, this is what it's about. It's, it's about truth. And let's, oh, Gianna, I waffled. How long have I got? Oh, I haven't even started. Oh, oh look, I, I've got to do something here. Okay, so let's, let's have a look. So, look, we won't turn there. You know. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, you know that God, after he made everything, he looked back and he said, hey, this is very good. I did a good job. I love it. And I, I, was, I was talking about this in Africa, and I said, and there they are sitting there in the, on, on the dirt and all the rest of it, and, and I said to them, hey, hey, there's something went terribly wrong. It ain't very good now, is it? I said, it was very good when God made it, but I tell you what, we've really messed it up. Because there's nothing very good anymore. You know, our governments are up the creek. 
You know, there's disease and poverty over there. They can't get decent water, no electricity, no medicals, no nothing. It's just, it's, it's just the yuckies of the yucks. And it's like that here. You know, families breaking up. There's drugs. There's everything. There, there's nothing good. What's very good about this? Well, it was very good, and we believed a lie, and now it's very bad. It was very good, but now it's very bad. And God has given us an opportunity to make ourselves and embrace the mind of Christ and have that to be the, our direction in life. And we're not. And what what turned them away from the truth? And I wrote down here what what happened in the Garden of Eden was just something very little. It wasn't much. It was a little lie. But what it did to humankind, it just distorted their priorities. Just distorted and went off the track. And God said, "I can see what's going to happen out." Just the slight distortion of your priorities. What I'm saying to you: get your priorities right. I don't care if you're filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, even to Scripture. It doesn't care if you're not getting your priorities right. Get your priorities right. Have a look at yourself. If you've been coming to church and think, oh, look, this is nice. I come to church and I put in my tithes and all that and all that you should do. I put all that in and all the rest of it and I'm good and I can just be what I am. I can go to work and still be a crummy fellow. I can still do this. I can still, yeah, what do you want and all the rest. Hey, was Jesus like that? Come on, let's lift the game. As uh, Paul said, I keep my body under subjection. And so we, we've had a look at that scripture. And then in, uh, in um, we could look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 and 17. And God says, don't love the world, neither the things in it. Well, so what does that actually mean, Pastor Vic? It means don't love the world, nor the things in it. Have a look at yourself. Have a look, because you are poisoned. I'm poisoned. Paul knew he was poisoned. He said, I, I know the right thing to do, but I, I have trouble doing it. That was Paul. I tell you what, that's me, that's everybody. And so what did he say? He said, but I know one thing. I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling to grab the mind of Christ and put it into myself and to walk in newness of life. And that's what we've got to do. And life has got a tendency to show us every day our failings if we are listening and watching and then, and then do something about it. But if we're not, if we're not taking notice of this, we won't even know. We will think, we, we, we think we're just so good. But I think you know what I'm talking about. And so we read... We read in, uh, let's have a look in Colossians chapter 1. Quickly, because we've just got to move a little bit quick. Colossians chapter 1. And because of time, we read, say, in verse uh, 9, And for this cause, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, uh, that you and desire that you might be filled with all the knowledge of his will and wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk or live your life worthy unto the Lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power so what's this glorious power I tell you something it ain't talking about the power that opened up the Red Sea it ain't talking about the power that gave the manna from heaven it ain't talking about the power with the pillar of fire or the cloud and I ain't talking about the power that pulled down the walls of Jericho. His glorious power is to alter, is to give you the opportunity to put on the mind of Christ. That's his real power because that power created everything. That power that opened up the Red Sea and pulled down the walls of Jericho, fed them from heaven, never changed a soul. And never altered them. Never altered their thinking. And in my perspective, the Old Testament was simply an example that no matter what miracle I do, it won't change you. You must be born again of the water and the Spirit and then walk in newness of life. Put on the mind of Christ. Bring yourself under subjection. Get into it. This is the high calling. Do you want to be around for eternity? 
That's what you've got to do. This is the high calling to be sons and daughters of the living God. This isn't church, and we don't play Mickey Mouse here. I don't know what he's got to do with it. It sounded good. We don't do that. And then we read here, and give thanks unto the Father which has made us meet, able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of life, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. We don't, we don't have to be there. You see, what happened in the Garden of Eden, as soon as we believed the lie, the lights went out, and we started to walk in darkness. You know, you know what happened? Not long afterwards, the first murder. Because of envy and jealousy. You know, hey, God created and it was very good. It wasn't long before it was very bad. And God has called us not to be like this, but to live in newness of life. And he has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom, the realm and the domain of his dear son. And what God has filled us with the Holy Spirit for one purpose and to one purpose only. So now we have the opportunity and ability, and ability to have a look at his dear son and then, to in, and then to embrace that image and to embrace that divine, glorious nature and to embrace it in ourselves. Because there's no greater power, there's no greater joy. Oh, friends, look, I, I'm, I've just scratched the surface, but I'll tell you what, my... my the teeth that I have that are mine tingle w when I see it. You know, the greatest power on earth is to love them that hate you. Because you have no fear. There's no anger. There's no animosity. Just like Jesus, even though they nailed him to the cross, he said, I forgive you. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know who I am. You're in darkness. I forgive you. We can love our enemies. Love them that hate you. Turn the other cheek. All those things are Christ-like. And all the people see. They might not be what you like, but they're Christ-like. You make your choice. What you like or what is Christ-like. And so we, we go on a little bit. And then in, in John chapter 8, uh, we'll just say, and because of the darkness that came, and he's delivered us, and Jesus came and he said, I am the light of the world. What, did he come with an Osram lamp in his mouth, like Uncle Festus? So what is this light? This light was the love and the joy and the peace and the long-suffering and the temperance and the gentleness and meekness of God, the faith of God. This is the light. And darkness can't see it. Even though you're filled with the Holy Spirit, I pray that you see it. Because this is the light of the world. This is, this is the light that you are called to be. To walk in the character. The, to the world, they'll think you're a blinking idiot. To God, he'll raise you up like his son on that day. You make your choice. You want to take the adulation of the world or of God? Are you going to please men or are you going to please God? Are you going to please your human nature, your flesh, or are you going to please God? Because the flesh is an enmity from God. Your body, where you sit right now, you are your own worst enemy. Have a look at your hand, put it to your mouth and bite it. That's your enemy. It's going to the grave and it wants to take you with it. That's your enemy. Identify it. There's no good thing in us except the ability to embrace the power of God that is in there to let it shine. If we don't let it shine, it doesn't mean anything. You are to be now this light of this world. So Jesus is the light of the world. And we read, we read on in John chapter 8. Let's have a quick look here. John chapter 8 and verse uh, 29. And it says here, And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. And Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. And it's interesting, but we could go back and we could read in, 
in uh, John chapter 1 and verse 4 to 5, where this wonderful light, Jesus, shined and the darkness didn't comprehend it. But Jesus still, he said, I do all those things that please my Father. And as he spoke these words, many believed on him. And Jesus then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, now that word, word is logos. And I've spoken to this about this before, and it's just important. The word logos is a very interesting word. The, uh, John, one of the disciples that, of course, wrote the, um, uh, the gospel of, of John and, uh, and said in the beginning was the word and the wor word was with God and so forth. He actually, out of the Greek, he took this word logos. And this word logos, as far as we understand by the, uh, the readings that I could see, this word logos was uh, first introduced by a Greek philosopher of that time, uh, Hedy Colossus, whatever his name was, some, some name that I can't pronounce. And that was about 600 years before Christ. And uh, that word, logos, means divine expression, divine reason and character, which is the coordinator of an ever-changing universe. It's the word logos. It doesn't mean scripture. It is, it is describing the character of God. And, and it's saying, and Jesus is saying here, even because you cannot hear my word, uh, later on, if you continue in my word, if you continue in this logos, and I'm going to show you that this logos is truth, and that is the only truth that we ever need to really bother about. That is the truth that you have received. You have received this logos in you. And uh, this wonderful logos, then you shall be my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, because logos is the truth we're going to see. And this truth is going to set you free. And the freedom is joy unspeakable and full of glory. The, the, the truth is that people in Africa uh, walk two or three hours to a meeting without food or water to come to a meeting. And they preach to others. What do they preach to them? Come to the Lord and God will give you a new washing machine. Da, 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 da. Got to be kidding me. None of that garbage. What do they preach? They preach salvation. They preach the coming of Jesus. They preach the knowledge of God. They preach the truth, which is the logos, the divine expression, which they can receive and embrace and be part of it. And this is what it's about. And it's interesting that the people in Africa are probably more akin to what the people were in Bible days than what we are. Because in Bible days, they lived very, very sparsely and things weren't good. They lived virtually in the dirt. And with, you know, no electricity, you know what I mean. And, and, uh, and they, were, they were governed by uh, wicked dictators. They had uh, rotten churches. They had, uh, they had uh, the Romans uh, taxing them to blazes. And Jesus came to those sort of people. And these sort of people got it. Us sort of people struggle to get it. Because we are bourgeois. It takes hold of us. And so we read here, and you, you shall know, and the truth shall make you free. And uh, they answered him, we've got Abraham to our seed. Oh, and they answered him, oh, but hold on, Jesus, I speak in tongues. So? And they said, hold on, Jesus, we've got Abraham. You know, we're not in bondage. I, you know, don't talk to me about Logos and having to change. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I speak in tongues. I'm okay. I've got Abraham. And he said, and, and, and uh, we're, we're Abraham's seed and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall, you shall be made free? Because we're, we're not in bondage. And Jesus said, verily I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And uh, we read on because of time uh, here in uh, verse uh, 38. And I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen of your father. And they said, uh, uh, and they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said unto them, If Abraham, w if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. 
but now you do seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God, and you and this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We are not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceedeth forth and come from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you can't understand my character and nature and divine divine expression. You just don't get it. You just don't get it. Ye, ye are your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you, 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 you will do. He was, he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Then he sp uh, when he spake a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And the word father, in this case, means the originator. The devil's the originator of the lie, and we listen to it. And we are paying the price for it. And the people that should have known didn't know because they couldn't understand the character of God. They couldn't understand his gentleness, his kindness, and his love. They just couldn't understand it. Because we trust no man. Take no prisoner. Let's build a bigger bomb. Let's make an electric wire fence. Why? Because we trust everybody. Because everybody's good. Why do we do this? And so Jesus was pointing out the fact that they had an issue and the problem was their issue was that they believed the lie from the liar right from the beginning. And then in uh, John chapter 14, we'll quickly go. And John chapter 14 and um, <clears throat> verse 5. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father except by me. The way to life is through truth. And we're going to see very quickly the truth. Let's have a uh, look because of time. I'm terrible. What time do you close? Because I, 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 I don't want to go over. We're over. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so because I'm not going to get to the point. All right, let's 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 do some let's just do some leapfrogging here. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, it was it's Africa. Um, let's have a look. In, um, in John chapter 1, let's go there quickly. I'll just, I'll just read out the scriptures and you can write them down if you're interested and then you can uh, check it out later. In John chapter 1 verse 1, it says here in the scriptures, In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And this is our dilemma. And our, my, my deep desire is that my light don't, doesn't go out. My deep desire is that I encourage us all to keep our light shining. And what is that light? It is truth. And what is that truth? It is Logos. I explain what Logos is. It is the divine expression, the divine reason and character which coordinates this universe. And in the beginning is this wonderful expression of truth. It is truth. It is Logos. And this, and this wonderful truth we read in verse 14, and this Logos, this, this word was made flesh so that God came in to the flesh so that we could see the divine expression how it is in the character of a body. And our Jesus was without spot or blemish and was wonderful. And I want to be like him. 
and I'm nothing like him. Because when I want to do the right thing, it's hard. And that's why I pray and I bring my body under subjection. Because I want to do all those things that please my father. Because I want to meet him in the air. And in the end, Paul saw it. And he said, he said I know waits for me a crown. I know I've made it. And I know each and every one of us, as we embrace this wonderful character of God, and as we are praying for it, as we're designed for it, this is our quest. This is what my prayer life is all about. It's about the quest of embracing and seeing ever more clearly. I remember many, many, many years ago, my desire was to see what Paul the Apostle saw, because I could see things happening in Paul's life that was absolutely contrary to what Pentecostal will Pentecostal people were preaching. In Paul's life, he had problems. He had hunger. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He had more problems you can poke a stick at. And the Pentecostal churches were saying, she's right, mate. It ain't that going to happen to you. Just put your tithes in the bag. And I thought, that, that's not right. Because what can happen in my life? What, what, I don't expect anything more or anything else in my life as Paul got in his life. And I want to see what Paul saw. I want to see what Stephen saw. I want to see how on earth is it possible for someone to be stoned and looking up and glorifying God. How is this possible? I want to see it because it's for me. It is possible. And I want to see it because I don't know about you because I can't do anything about you. You you do what you do. You think what you think. You say what you say. I can't alter that. But I can alter what I say. I can alter what I do. I got, I got authority over me. I got no authority over you. And I can take charge of myself. And I want to see what Paul saw. I get calluses on my knees to, to pray, to see it, to understand it. Because I know that's what's going to meet me in the, what's going to have me to meet the Lord in the air. Because I understand scripture that says, although I speak in tongues of men and angels and have not embraced this logos of God, this love of God, I am nothing. And I don't want to be nothing. And I don't, I don't want to believe this body of sin. It's my enemy and I know it is. I know it is. And I could easily say, more than a lot of people, oh, Lord, Lord, look what I've done. Never knew you, Vic. Sorry, buddy. And I want to meet the Lord in the air. And the first principle and the main gain is truth. And that truth is the love of God. God is love, which is truth. And that wonderful truth we could read, and, and if you want to write this down, you could read that it says in John chapter 17, verse 13 to 17, it says, and the Logos is truth. And then it goes on to say, the spirit of truth. So the truth, the Logos went into the flesh. Then this wonderful Logos that was put on the cross for us came in the spirit and has now entered into us. And now the true worshippers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And this truth is this wonderful Logos. And so now we are to be the lights of the world. And all the people said, thank you. Sorry for being so long.